Are you an avid hunter looking for the perfect trailer to haul your gear? Look no further than Team Lodge trailers. These trailers are made in South Dakota and for the ultimate hybrid of a camper and a trailer. With the ability to haul your side-by-side -side ATV, dirt bike, e-bikes, and more, you'll never have to leave your gear behind. They are extremely sturdy with no wind shake or movement when someone is walking in the camper. Plus, they are waterproof and designed by hunters who actually use the product. The bear-proof base camp ensures to safety while out in the wild. You'll also love that these trailers are outfitted with the only accessories and the features you want. Premium components are used in every part of the setups, making Team Lodge trailers the best choice for your outdoor adventures. Hey there, fellow hunters and shooting enthusiasts. Are you tired of ear ringing shots and the fear of permanently damaging your hearing? Nobody wants to be that old guy. Look no further than Silencer Central. These top of the line silencers not only protect your hearing, but also allow for that second shot if needed. The target's not even spooked by the crack of the rifle. They also provide a ship in barrel threading service, making the process easy and precise. Speaking of easy, don't let the paperwork pr process from the ATF deter you. Silencer Central makes it easy. They will walk you through the online forms over the phone. Upgrade your hunting game and protect your hearing with Silencer Central. I appreciate you coming on. Derek Wolf, the main, the man, the legend. <laughs> <laughs> the Man. legend lion hunter yeah it's wild it's it's so crazy to me that that people know me for killing a lion now you know it's like well i think they know you from a lot more than that yeah but, but people world... people will see me out in public and be like you're the guy that killed that lion right not like oh you're the super bowl champion or <laughs> you know the, <laughs> you played for the broncos for 10 years eight years you know and it's like uh you know it's, it's so to me it's i told you this whenever you brought me that plaque or the uh the thing you made me with the cover that I've been on the cover of sports illustrated. I've done all this and done that and been on the, you know, covers for different sports magazines and stuff, but to be on the, on the cover of Eastman's was like, Holy shit. Like I couldn't, I couldn't believe it, man. I was like shocked. You I know, you said that. I thought there's no way that's true. It's you so true, it's, man. It's I illustrated. For I know, sense. but it's like, I, I, I expected that. You know what I mean? Like I expected for that to happen. I guess. You know, it wasn't <laughs> like, you know, I expected to be, you know, in those kind of, those kind of um, situations where I'd make big plays and big games and it, that's what happens. Right. But to be on the cover of Eastman's growing up a bow hunter and you know, that was like, Every bow hunter has an Eastman's magazine in their, you know, sitting in their coffee table at their house. You know, yeah. every little farm where I'm from up in Youngstown, south of Youngstown, Ohio. So Northeast Ohio, um, you know, everybody that hunts, man, Eastman's hunting journal is sitting right there on their, on their coffee table. So I always thought, man, it'd be cool to just like, you just see these giant bucks, giant <laughs> elk, like, you know, and that's like where my love for, for hunting started was there. So. You know, yeah, so, to make it f come full circle is just so incredible to me. You know, now I just want to do it again. I want to like, how do I, how do I top that and do something cooler and, and make it even, you know, right. even more of a cool, cause it was just a cool story behind that lion too. And then, um, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I'm not out here just trying to like make the cover of things, right? Like I genuinely love to hunt. It is it's something that I have a huge passion for. It's something that you know, drives my wife crazy because I'm gone a lot doing it. And, you know, and, you know, she's got, she's just like really holds it down for me. So there's a, there's a lot of pieces that go into this. And I remember growing up watching like, you know, real tree and they would always like get emotional and like really think their wives afterwards. And I'd be like, why is he doing that? Yeah. You know? And now that I'm married and I'm, you know, I have kids and stuff. I realized that like the real toll is, is put on your, your spouse when you have children and you love to do this because you know, you can't bring it. I can't take, I couldn't have taken my four year old out and done that with me today. Right. She right. would have been, you know, yelling and goofing right. around and knocking stuff over and swinging sticks around. And so like me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, well, like Levi, like my camera guy, you know, he's just loud out there. <laughs> well, but, actually let's talk about that. So we're in uh, uh Northeast Montana and we had the opportunity to come up here with one of our our good friends on an on a guided whitetail western whitetail hunt and um it, it was unique because you were able to, to kill a hell of a buck and uh that should be on youtube should be on your youtube it'll yeah. be on the outdoor channel um to, to see this adventure but it's neat to see a passion 
come through from somebody that has, you know, you've accomplished so much in your life that, but you still get that passion for hunting. So you grew up in, in North, uh, Northeast, uh, Ohio. Did you always hunt? Was this something? That- yeah. Yeah. I've hunted since, you know, I start. so the, <clears throat> we'll start from the beginning, right? Yeah, so, yeah. um, my, when I was really young, my stepdad would go on like little random hunts here and there. And, um, you know, he'd hand me a 410 and stick me under a tree yeah. and don't shoot, don't yourself. move. Well, he'd say, don't move, you know? <laughs> and if a deer comes by, shoot it, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, all right. And I'll never forget the first time that a, a deer, like the first time that we went to, we went to like one of his buddy's farms and it's known for having like a lot of deer. But when we pulled up there, there was like 10, 15 trucks, you know? So you got like, and it's like opening day of gun season there. So you can only hunt with a shotgun in Ohio. So oh, everybody, no everybody is still hunting out there, just walking around, walking around, bumping deer and firing, sh- firing slugs at them, you know? <laughs> and this is a, not a huge farm. Like we're talking like 200 acres, 300 acres max. Wow. So it's not huge. And it's, so there's a lot of people hunting it. So it was like, we saw that nobody would kind of, we got there kind of early. We saw nobody walked over there. He sticks me under a pine tree and being, I was like, I think I was 12, 11, 12 years old. Okay. And so it was my first time like getting a hunt. I, I had hunted pheasants and turkey and stuff like that and with my friends and stuff, but never killed a deer yet. So he sticks me under a tree and being that I was still big and then boots, then nobody had boots that fit me. So you've so being, always been big. Yeah, I've always been been big. Yeah, I was always, but I grew up in Ohio. You didn't realize how big you were because there's a lot of big boys in Ohio, you know? Mm-hmm. So I wasn't even like the biggest kid in my high school. You know, you're was, kidding me. Yeah, I wasn't the biggest kid in my high. I I was like the tallest and overall biggest, but like as far as like big goes, like right. there was another kid. His name was Derek too. Oh no, kidding! And he was huge. Yeah, um, he was like a three hundred pounder. Oh, I'll bet, I'll bet freshman the, year, you know, just a big dude. I'll bet that was a, f- a football team to be uh, reckoned. Yeah, with. we had a fun time. Yeah, I'll we bet. had a good time just mauling people. But um, so he sticks me in a tree, and I had these steel toed boots on that were his like work boots, oh, and it was for reason cold. I mean, freezing cold. I was, it was snowing. There was like three inches of snow on the ground. It was like perfect deer hunting weather, you know. Well, but not perfect for steel not toes. perfect for steel toes. And I'm sitting there with that little four iron sighted four ten under a pine tree, shivering so hard, like so cold. But I didn't I didn't want to move because he told you he told move. me don't move, and I know what happens when I don't listen. So right. yeah, um, so I didn't move, and I just sat there. And this little eight point comes in, and I'm like, oh wow, there's a buck, and every blade of grass was in the way <laughs> every, you're sitting on the grass and, or ground so everything the grass but, is all eye level but i was like but it, it still like i could see his body fine it was just like oh there's a blade of grass i don't oh there's not oh oh there's oh so and then this doe come there's a doe in there and she kind of like she kind of like is acting weird and then i hear and i'm like oh what is that and this i mean this huge that buck comes in like to me you know he, he looked, it's probably like 140, 150 oh inch deer. Gosh. Yeah. Huge 10 point. I mean, he dwarfed this eight point. It was a nice eight point dwarfed him. He comes in and I was like, Oh yeah. And I like, I'm like, I'm going to shoot him. And I was like, I got buck fever. Really? I mean, I started shivering and shaking and I was like <laughs> hyperventilating. <laughs> like I couldn't, I didn't know what to do. He was only like 10 yards from me, Like he was right in front of me. Like, couldn't have been put in a better spot to kill a deer. Like, and I think what happened was that my stepdad, when he went off walking, he probably bumped them and they bumped over to me. And so I'm sitting there. I'm sure he knew that. No, he did not. <laughs> he was just trying to get me out of the way so he could go do his thing, you know? And so I, I didn't end up pulling it. He ended up chasing that, that buck off and then the doe ran off. And then like 30 seconds later, I hear boom. I'm like, oh man, somebody shot him. And then I'm sitting there like, why didn't I shoot that deer? And it was like, I was so enamored by like the way they were acting that I just was watching them. You know what I mean? And just watching how they acted. And it was so cool because I'd seen it on hunting shows, you know, growing up, you know, watching Primos and Real Tree Outdoors right, and all this right. stuff. You know, you're watching all you know, these hunting shows. And you see that kind of stuff on camera that you're like, man, that'd be so cool. And I thought they were going to fight. Because like, to, in my mind, I'm like, when two bucks come together and there's a doe, they get in a yeah, fight. It's going to be violence. I didn't realize that like, yeah, this little eight point is not going to, you know, he's like 120, 130 inch eight point. He's not going to fight this giant 10. He's going to run off. He's, he runs off and I hear boom. And I'm like, oh man. So I sit there for like another two hours freezing. Oh. And like at that point, I didn't care if I saw another deer. I was like doing everything I could to try to stay warm. You know, I'm just sitting like in a ball. He finally comes down and gets me. He goes, you see anything? I was like. 
yeah, I saw a couple deer. And he's like, well, why didn't you shoot one? And I was like, oh, I didn't have a shot. And he was like, oh, geez. Well, where were they? And I was like, they were like right there. He's like, what do you mean you didn't have a shot? It's like 10 yards. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know. And he's like, he just like shook his head and was like, all right, let's go. Yeah, he's just disappointed. You know, he's like, all right, well, let's go. So we're walking out and strung up in, that, in a tree right there is that eight point. Somebody else. Not, somebody else. Not your stepdad. Not my stepdad, but somebody else shot that eight point. Uh-huh. And I was like, man, there's another big one out there, you know? And I don't know if anybody ever shot that deer, but to me, that's like the, it was like the biggest deer I ever seen, you know? And it was ever since that moment, like anytime, like a buck that got me fired up came by, I didn't, I didn't waste any time, you know? And then we saw that today. Right. Like that buck got me as soon as I saw him in my binos, I was like, oh, there's, that's a stud, yeah. you know? Like you can tell how a mature buck acts. They, if it's a mature buck, you can tell those younger ones, they act kind of goofy. Yeah. You know, they're running around all over the place, but a, a mature one, he is like, you can tell that he's running the roost over there. And, um, <laughs> it's like so middle the, schoolers versus high schoolers versus men. Mm-hmm. That's and the difference. so, I, and it's happened to me a couple of times. So my next, um, I started bow hunting finally. And I started, I picked up a bow. It was a good friend of mine that lived, you know, I, I, I lived on like my friend's couches growing up, you know, I was like always in and out of in and out of the house. And, you know, my parents weren't really involved in my life very much. They were doing their own thing and had their own problems. And I was kind of doing my own thing, taking care of myself and had, it takes a tribe to raise, you know, right. kids and I eat a lot of food and, you know, so I'll bet you have outstay your welcome in some places and have to go. And yeah. did you have some good mentors and, you know, from those couches? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Especially in like, um, especially once I got to high school and started living on a black Angus farm, like I had a, the family that took me in, and then I have, um, who I call dad now, you know, he's like, he's like a father figure to me. Um, he's, he's also one that he was just like always real busy. So it was like here and there, I didn't live with them, but I spent a lot of time with him mm-hmm. and his boys. And, um, you know, he's really successful in the business world. So he's like helped me post career, like taught me about financial literacy and stuff like that. But, um, the next, the next like big hunting experience I had, you know, I got the, that's the other thing, football always came first, you know? So it was like, you get to hunt here and there. And, um, when I was, uh, 13, we were, I was like, yeah, I was like 13 going on. It was eighth grade going in. I was like in eighth grade and we were hunting my buddies, Josh, his name is Josh. We were hunting his farm and, uh, his brother was a little bit bigger and he had a bow, an old PSE that fit Mm -hmm. that I could shoot. So I was shooting that and he had like some camo that I could wear and he had an old climber that I could use. So, we started, it was kind of, it was funny. Cause as soon as I picked that, I shot the first time I shot that bow, it was like, it felt natural to do it. It didn't feel like awkward. Awkward. Like he explained to me, like, look through the peep anchor, look through the peep and then release. And I was like, okay. And I did it. And it was like, no problem. It's like, you've been doing it for years. It felt so natural. Wow. And I was like, man, I was like, this is cool. Like I, you know, I like this. It, it, I was like naturally drawn to it. You know, mm-hmm. it felt more, um, it felt more natural than like even pulling a trigger did, you know? Right. So we, um, he had a release I could use and everything. So I just was using his stuff. And so I'd go over there and spend the weekend over there with him and stay for like, you know, four or five days at a time. And we'd just hunt every day. And, um, I got to, I got to, I got to learn from him and his brothers how to really hunt deer with a bow. And they didn't hunt like the, they weren't like the, a lot of guys in Ohio will hunt the same corn pile every year and kill a big buck every year, but they're just like, it's, that's cool. But like if I'm hunting one big buck, cool. But like me, I'm like, I want to like see different parts of the woods and, you know, try different strategies and try to like out scheme a deer and play that little mental chess game that you play with them. And, you know, (laughs) the whole time, what we would do is we'd wake up in the morning, um, eat a bullet cookie crisp and then go jump in the stand and sit there till noon. Wow jump down for, you know, an hour, go eat a sandwich and then get back in the stand. You know, and this is, you know, we were young and it was like, you're up there by yourself. And so the, this one morning, finally, like the, I just could not like get a, I, I couldn't get like a decent buck to just walk by me. You know, it was like just too far, you know, just like, yeah, he's at 200 yards or he's a hundred yards or he's, he's like skirting me. And, yeah. and I think a lot of that was because I wasn't sitting still. Because so he heard you or, or yeah, saw movement and, or and I think that, yeah, yeah. And I think that like, even at 13, you know, I was like, you know, 200 and something pounds and, 
you know, six Jeez. foot three, you know, I'm like six foot three, like 200 pounds, 215 pounds or something at that age. Oh so I'm God. like, I still, you still look like a big blob sticking off the end of a tree edge of a tree, you know? Yeah. So like I started climbing higher and higher and then I was like, well, now I'm like so high that the angle is so extreme that I'm shooting at that like, you know, so it came down to like, I started looking at like what my backdrop was. So I was like, okay, what does my backdrop look like? So that made a difference, you know, that helped. But this one morning, it, what would happen is I, uh, we had our, those old track phones, remember? Oh so yeah. I'd have a couple minutes on there, you know, and I'd send them, I'd send Josh a message at like eight 30 and be like, you ready? And he'd be like, no, I'm not ready. <laughs> Like, what are you talking about? You know, because he was always had like one buck that he was trying to you know, trying to hunt me. I'm just up there like hoping a, something with antlers would walk by me, you know. And uh, and we were stupid. We'd be up there stomping around the night before setting up our climber so we didn't have to do it in the morning. <laughs> and it's like we didn't, you know, that was stupid. You know, we should have just climbed. You're better off just making the noise in the morning and then letting it settle down and then they'll come back, you know. Right. But uh, finally I climb up the tree and I go up like, I think I was like 22 feet. Um, cause that's what my pull rope was, was 22 feet. I go up 22 feet and, um, I was always sketched out about climbing too high. Uh, also, because one time my, my, uh, the, I didn't have the bottom tied to the, to the seat oh, geez. and it dropped and I had to use my legs and like climb down with my legs. And that was just super sketchy. And I was, and you know, and it was <laughs> yeah. ruined the hunt. So, um, finally I, that, so that had, I was like always worried about going too high because of that. And, even if that was, that was connected now, I still was like sketched out about it. So I get up there a decent, really good height in the dark and pull my bow up and I set my bow on like my little bow hook and I'm sitting there and I didn't have binos, like couldn't afford binos. Can, can you even see that far though? I mean, that's thick. Yeah. You yeah. Can. You can oh, see yeah. far enough. You'd need well, there that. was a field. There was oh. a, I was on the edge of a field and then I was on like the, he had like a four wheeler trail that was like right here. So it was like a a hedgerow with a finger coming out and then like big timber behind me. Okay. So they're all coming out of the, I'm expecting them to come out of this timber out of the, cause I'm like, I circled around and got the wind, right? Yeah. You know, the wind's blowing into the field. So I'm expected or like kind of crosswind. So I'm expecting to catch them on that crosswind. Right. And, um, that morning I decided, you know what? I'm gonna sprinkle a little corn on the, on the trail next to a cut cornfield. <laughs> I don't know. You couldn't pick something else? <laughs> yeah. Something they like, haven't been eaten on for three months? <laughs> I was like, this will get them. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, as I'm sitting there, um, I had, did have these little these little Bushnell, these little shitty binos that just were not very good. You know? Yeah. They weren't mine. I just, it was some, they had some extra ones laying around. They let me use them. Um, no bite. They're just like hanging around my neck, you know? And I'm sitting up there and. Probably used for the opposite. no clue what kind of no clue what kind of broadheads I'm using or what could, my grain my arrow is could care less about any of that you know what I mean was it even carbon fiber or was it or were they aluminum I have no idea I have <laughs> what, no clue what was it? do you know it that? was a PSE well it's, it's, yeah. the first one was a PSE yeah it was a PSE That's but awesome. it wasn't mine it was it was just a loner basically right. um, and the D loop had to be even they had to put an extra long D loop on there because it's still the draw length was still not like long enough you know <laughs> so and it was like. I think it was 65 pound pull. Wow. So I was still pulling back pretty, you know, pretty good weight. And, and in your length, that's, that's cooking. Yeah, that's, that was cooking. So, and I was hitting bottle caps at 75, 80 yards. Even back then. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was like, that I, I was, it was just, we shot our bows all the time. It was just fun. You know, I loved it. And so that morning that I'm looking at these, I mean, it's probably 300 yards on the other side of this field. These two big 10 points are over there chasing does around and i'm like oh man like if one of those comes over here like they're probably good. like I, I don't know what in my head thought why would they come they're gonna come over here but i was like they might yeah you know and then while that was happening i looked down and there's like an eight point below me like bone white eight point you know and i'm like oh man he stops at the corn for a second and i could but i didn't have my bone my your hand. corn worked yeah he stops at the corn and he like is, he munches on the corn for a minute and he just like, I couldn't move because when you stand up, like you got to see him, you know how those climbers are. It's like, yeah. when you stand up. Right. So I'm like, I can't move. And I just sat there and let him walk and he just kept walking. And I like went to stand up finally when he was like, kind of like 20 yards away. And cause he was only like seven yards in front of me, you know? So like finally he starts to walk away and he hears that thing's, and he's 
you know, pops his head right up at me and looks at me and sees me and bolts off. And I'm like, dang it. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, well, I'm at that point I'm standing up. And then like three minutes before I could sit down, I just stood there for a minute and kind of like sulked in it, you know, and like, damn, you know, that was my opportunity. Who knows if that's going to happen again. Right. I was, but those two big bucks were still out there. So I'm still like, maybe they'll come. I'll just stand here. Like, cause I don't want that to happen again. You know? So I'm just standing there in this tree and this little fork buck comes in and I just was like, it's a, it, today's not your day, bud. <laughs> shot in the face over this. And I was yeah. all fired up too. Cause he I was like, Oh, he's got horns. I'm going to shoot him. Oh my gosh. So he was like, he comes in. He doesn't even like, doesn't look at the corn. He's like eating on some leaves or something. And he was at 17 yards hit him and I watched him crash like 10, 15 yards from where I shot him. Oh my gosh. And I was like, the, the feeling that I had was so incredible. Like I was like, I can't, I can't believe that happened. Like, I can't believe it just happened. Like I'm shaking so bad, you know, I'm shaking, I'm freaking out. And, um, I text Josh, I said, come get me. He goes, it's only seven 30. And I was like, I shot one. He goes, no, you didn't. He's like, just stay up there for a little bit. And I was like, I could see it. He's dead. Oh and he was like, all right, I'm coming to get you. So he comes out, he gets on a four wheeler, comes up there and gets me. And he's like, he's like, I just want you to know, I bumped my target buck on the way up here. He was walking right towards me. You know, he's all fired up. But then we saw the buck was laying there dead. And when you're, you know, we didn't care what their antler size was. We just, no. the fact that we had a deer on the ground, I was so jacked up and um, just holding those little forks, man. I was so like, so happy, you know, just, and then being able to eat the meat from that. So did you guys wait, but did you know what to do with it after it was dead? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I knew so how to gut a so deer you'd been around. You'd been around enough that. No yeah. I knew how to gut a deer, tag it, okay. take it to the processor. Um, we take it to the processor. <clears throat> and, um, I couldn't afford to pay for any of the meat to get done. So the processor like hooked it up, you know, really? He was like, that's your first deer. I said, yeah, man. He was like, he's like, he's like, all right, you kill it with a gun or a bow. I was like, bow. He's like, he's like, well, that's pretty impressive. You know, he's like, all right, well, um, he's like, well, I, he's like, I'll get you some jerky and, and some steaks. And, you know, you can, obviously I can't, I don't need all the burger and everything, but like, right. he got me some steaks and some, some jerky and snack sticks. And that was like the coolest thing ever, man. Cause it was, it was just so like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it to people that don't do it because you know, the good thing is most people are listening to this. Yeah, doing all, it, so <clears throat> we all so, understand. So it. we all, we, we all get it that there's something like primal about it, you know, being like, able to bring in your own food and, and, and go, f- you know, field the plate literally is one of the most gratifying things a human can do. It actually. really is because it's, I, we're coded. Yeah. You know, we talked about this uh, last night, you know, <laughs> we are coded to like survive off of things that we kill. That's what we're coded to do. Or it, grow. It doesn't have to be just yeah. kill. It could be grow. Well, I think it's even more so kill. I, I know that farming is still new in the in the in the grand scheme of like the lifeline of humans. That's true. Farming is still fairly new. It was gathering. Yeah, it was gathering and hunting is how we survived. And to be able to go do that and to do it like I know it's not stick bow, primitive hunting, whatever. But like to do it with a bow is still hard. You still got to get close to them. You still got to, you know, I know we have all this technology now, you know, we got range finders and this and that, but you know, at the end of the day, man, like you still had to like outsmart a deer that it's like somebody walking into your house, you know what I mean? And being sneaky in your house and you you just come walking, you're going to get out of your bed, walk into your kitchen and somebody sneaks up on you and shoot you. Like, yeah. And you know, you, you know, the presence of somebody that's in your, in your house, even though you never heard anything, yeah. you know, something is off no matter, <laughs> you know, no matter what, what advantages, you know, six hour range finders or, or stabilizing binos or whatever rifle bow, you, you know, that sixth sense because that's your house and that's what they yep. have. They have a sixth sense because that's their train and, and in my opinion to outwit a mature animal and that's what this is about is trophy hunting selective harvest we've talked about that mm-hmm. last night selective harvesting a trophy is in my opinion it is the perfect uh culmination is it's that's me that's my winning that's why i call it a trophy is because i won that yeah i outsmarted that. i outsmarted him yeah i didn't I didn't just jump out of the truck and shoot him or yep. this and that. Like 
there's that's the funny other thing man i've had opportunity i've had opportunities growing up to where i could have just like we were just like driving around the four-wheeler and you know had a muzzle loader during the end of the season and i could have probably shot a deer that but it was like eh, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel right you know like mm-hmm. something about it just didn't feel right so i just didn't do it you know because i i think those were those those um those values like as a hunter and the ethics, the ethics and those things were ingrained into me by people that did it the right way. You know, um, the people that I hunted with, they all hunted the right way. They did it. They did the way you're supposed to by the book, you know? Um, so let's talk about that. <clears throat> you and I were talking a little bit last night about, you know, that as hunters, <clears throat> we need to come together more than we separate. Yeah. And, and is there an ethical way to hunt? Yes. But it, but, it doesn't match just because mine doesn't perfectly match yours doesn't mean mine's wrong or yours is exactly. wrong. It's just different. If you want to ride around in a truck and blast it out of the door, as long as, in my opinion, as long as it's legal, I don't care. Have at it. Yeah. If you want to shoot behind a high fence, have at it. That's just not something I'm interested in. You know right. what? I don't, I don't wear red sweatshirts. It's not something I'm interested in. Yeah. You do. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm exactly. making that up. I, it's no, I know, but it's, but... it's, it's, it really does boil down to as simple as that is like, you know, we, there's a whole, we, what I said, what I would talk, what I said last night is something that I've been preaching since I like really kind of jumped into this, um, into this industry, you know, cause this is to me, it's, it's a passion of mine and it's something that I love to do. I don't do it to earn a living. I do it for fun. And filming my hunts is not, I'm not doing it because I'm like, Oh, I want everybody to think I'm this big buck killer or this big bull killer, or a giant mountain lion killer. I do it because I like to watch it. I like to be able to go back and watch my hunt. Right. I like to watch, like, I like to watch the shot, especially the shot, because I want to see where I hit him, especially if that deer or whatever it is runs off. I want to like, I don't, that anxiety of not knowing where he got hit, Makes me crazy. So like when I can go and look and be like, okay, hit him a little back or I hit him a little, you know, hit him a little high or hit him a little low. Like those things when you're bow hunting are really huge, you know? And it's like watching film, right? It is like watching film. And like, I can be like, oh, like I, like I was watching some stuff from my elk hunt this year in New Mexico. And I was like, I was like, you know what? I could have had that bull dead if I would have done it. If I would have, cause that now that I'm looking at the film and the terrain, like, I probably could have, you know, played it a little more safe there. Like I didn't need to go in that way. Like I could have waited and circled around these big junipers. And then that big bull, I had a nice big three thirty, three forty 340 bull that just kind of like, I thought the cows were the ones that were going to see me and he saw me. And I was like, Hmm, I was like, you know what? I should have went around instead of going straight there. Cause I was like too focused on the cows. And that was like a good learning lesson, right? And that's that's one of the best parts about filming it is that you can go back and watch and be like, oh man, like this is what I did wrong. Or, you know, a lot of luck goes into this too. Like it you got to get like, even today, the way that that went down with that buck, like we we did just about everything right, but he we still needed that little 10% of screw up from him. Yep. You still need that deer to, or that elk or that bear, or like who whatever it is that you're hunting. They got to screw up that little 10% because you can do everything a hundred percent. But if he doesn't do everything, if he does everything a hundred percent, right, he still wins yes. because that's just the way it goes, you know, and he screwed up because he, we started rattling and that got him all wound up and we were going to move up. We, that was a situation where we, we made the right choice by just staying there for a little longer instead. Cause Levi and I were just going to take off and go. And I was like, well, let's, you know, Levi's like, well, let's tell JD that we're going to do it, you know, cause right. And then he's like, oh, you want to do a little spot and stock? And I said, yeah, let's do it. And he's like, well, let's go. And then it's like, oh, hold on a minute. He's chasing a buck. He was, he was like chasing another buck away and followed it. You know, that's how you could tell he'd come up over the hill. And I was like, oh, here we go. Here we go. It's on. And he came to 105 yards and stood there. Broad, we stopped him broadside and I made a good shot and dropped him. And I was like, man, we could have really screwed that up because we were overthinking it, you know, and we, we did everything right. Okay. Now let's be patient. And that's where the hard part of hunting is, is to be patient, knowing when to go and when to stay. When, like, how many times have you been like, especially tree stand hunting? I can't tell you how many times I've done like all day November sits and been like, man, I should move and go somewhere else. But then like I stayed just a little longer and 
out of nowhere, midday, I'm sitting downwind from a bedding area and here comes a buck rolling through, you know, mm -hmm. he might not be a giant, but at least I, you know, I had the right idea, you know, I, and that's, that's where like, um, when I played football, it was like, <laughs> I would do, I would set things up for later, right? Like I would work a move on a guy because you only get a couple one-on-ones a game. So I'm going to work this move when I get this opportunity and try to beat him with it, but I'm going to show him one thing. And then the next time I'm going to show him that and then like counter to another thing. Right. And then that's going to set him up to like sit back and then I can bull rush him and long arm and then come off and get a sack. And then, then it's like third, fourth quarter. And when you need a big play and a tight game, and that's how that happens. It's, it's not that play it's for, it's set up for plays. Before. Exactly. Do you think that's, I mean, in hunting, I know this is true, and in, in, in business, and in, in in almost everything you do in life, it, it's it's a it's an instinct. You know, you know how to act, react when a certain thing happens, and you're always playing the offense. You're never playing the defense. Yep. You're always instead of reacting, you're acting. Yeah, um, we talk about that on our EBJ podcast. Uh, Dan and, and Dan Picar and Brian Barney talk about that all the time. It's always you're always playing two steps ahead of, of whatever it is. You know that bull's going to stop in this window because you call at the right time and you let the arrow go at the exact time that bull stops so he has no time to load his muscles and run off or whatever it is. And they talk about that all the time. Same thing in football, I, I assume. You know how that guy's going to react to whatever move you put him put on him two, you know, two plays before so that when it's critical, you hammer it. Yeah, and I think what you're exactly right. And I think that the most important part of all of that is the reps. So I would do it in practice. I would do those things in practice on, on our scout team guys and on our, um, on our guys that were on like our second team, like the guys that are practicing against you and running those, the other team's plays I'm do, I'm working those, those scenarios with those guys, mm -hmm. even in like one-on-one -on -one pass rush, a lot of guys get caught up and would get caught up in like, Oh, well everything's on film. Right. So, you, you don't want to be in film and be like, oh, I, I got beat, you know, because you just it looks bad. Right. But sometimes I'll let it. I know I'm going to get to go against him two or three times. So I'll give him one thing like I'll give him one thing in this first rep. It might not work. It might look silly. All right. Then the next one, I'm going to do the same same thing, but different, like in a different direction. Right. So now I got him guessing. All right. Now I got it. Now I got it. Now, as soon as I get off the ball, I have an idea of what's going to happen in my head for that third rep. And I get him to shoot his hands a little earlier. I get him to step back a little step back and like reset his hands before I even shoot mine. And that gives me an opportunity to like take advantage of that. Right. And that's the same thing with, with hunting. Like you can't expect to just like, Oh, I hunt, I get to hunt like two or three times a year and you, you go out there and then you don't know what to do because you haven't had the reps. Right. And that's where, you know, I have, I talk about this with my wife all the time. I'm like, you know, I just like, She's like, oh, how come you didn't get a bull this year? And I'm like, well, because this is my second year elk hunting, yeah. you know, and I've only been on two elk hunts before this. So it's like, you know, if they're not, I don't know what to, I didn't know what to do if they're not responding to me. Like, do I sit water? No, because that's boring and yeah. like nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying like, I don't for have you. It's boring for me. I don't, it's boring to me. Cause I'm like, I know there's bulls all over the place in here. I want to just like go find them and try to sneak on them, you know? And, um, what we ended up doing was, you know, we got, we followed this herd, this big herd bull for eight miles. And then I'm glad we did because it got to, I got to experience something that people go a whole lifetime and don't get to experience, which is like a real rut fest with like really big bulls, you know, yeah. and to see, you know, to see 330, 340 inch bulls cower to another bull that's that big. It's like, it's something cool. It's so cool, you know, and we had, we followed that herd bull and he's like, you know, 60 cows followed them forever, you know, for eight miles. And then they, they ended up running into like another herd bull that was like Ooh. 350, 360. And then this other like 340 bull came, he had a bunch of cows. They all three like ended up in the same oh spot. Oh my gosh. The perfect storm. They it just was crashed into each oh, other. Oh, they were just ripping bugles and. <laughs> The cows are, meow, meow, you know, I mean, it was just so much fun. It was so cool to just, and I'm only like 150, 200 yards away from them, you know, sitting there watching this go down and their wind is right. And, um, I'm, then they finally like, I'm like, 
I'm waiting for them to start fighting so I can like really just run in there, you know, and they wouldn't fight. Like none of them would fight. They were just raking trees and, you know, putting on a show, you know, you know what the hell they do, yeah. you know, peeing on themselves, yeah. and, you know, raking trees oh, and yeah. yelling and just nasty. They're just yeah, nasty. They're just so nasty. <clears throat> um, and the, they're just nasty. And I, and I was like, Oh man, I was like, I was like, what's going to, he was like, just wait a second. They're going to chill out and bed down. Like they've been on the move and they're going to get, they're going to want to chill out here. Like all the cows are settled down now. Like there's spikes everywhere. There's one bull that had seven on seven on one side. I mean, huge rack on the left side and his right side was just like a like a, a, a like a point and then it hooked down oh geez and i was like man All he's cool looking mess. too i was like any of those bulls were cool but the one bull i was after was this i mean he was huge i don't know what he measured and taped out at but to me it was the you know it was the that's alpha. exactly what i'm looking for and every bull that like came around him like you know how they stop and just stare and cower and mm-hmm. then like slowly move away and that's that's what they, every bull that like saw him did that. They did not want to fight with this dude, and his body was so much bigger than these other bulls. And I was like, "Yeah, that's the one. That's the big mature yep. bull in this whole area. That that's who. That's what we're looking at. That's what we're after." He lays down in the perfect spot, like right in between two big junipers, facing away in the shade with cover. I had cover the whole way up to him. I could. I was going to be able to get to like 10, 12 yards before. And then stand him up, you know, and then just like make, a, you know, make something kind of noise and get him to stand up. But the problem was, is I had a, three cows and a spike that were on the same plane as him, but they were just above me. So I needed them to go. I needed them to go like 10 yards more, like feed a little bit further. Right. And they were doing it. They were just doing it like slowly, very, you know how they are so slow, just like, and then. It, when you're out there and it you're like felt really slow, it felt it wasn't but. so slow. It felt like, yeah. And it, it wasn't, it was only like 10, Seconds. 15 minutes. Actually. Oh, okay. But it, which felt like, I felt like I've been sitting there for an hour, you know? And I was like, and I was like, I need to go. I need to go after him. And my, uh, my buddy was like, dude, don't go. I'm telling you, like, don't screw this up. Cause that cow, those spikes are the ones that give you away. They bark at you and it's over yeah. and they're all going to be running out of here. And he's like, just wait, wait for another 10 minutes and they'll be gone. Well, they start to move and I'm like, oh, now it's on. And then I hear a bull bugle and I'm like, what is that? And it's like to my left. And I was like, that sounds like a person. And I'm like, well, maybe he'll come down here and we can go in here together. Well, then the bulls don't bugle back. So he doesn't, it doesn't, I don't hear it again. So wait for like, so now it's like we're going on like 40 minutes of sitting there and I'm like, fuck what am i gonna do he did, he hadn't moved the bull's still sitting there chilled out everything kind of settles down i'm like all right and then i hear just all this crashing going on i mean two bulls are i thought two it was two bulls fighting they started fighting and a couple cow calls come in and then i'm like dude i gotta go they're fighting he's like yeah but the bull that you want to kill is not fighting he's like if you push up on the, those cows are still right there they're gonna see you right and i'm like no they're not and then everything gets up and leaves. Like they all, they all get up and they just take off running. And I'm like, what the hell happened? Now what? And I'm standing there and I'm looking through my binos and here comes a guy walking with the wind to his back and a bow, his bow in his hand with an arrow knocked, looking around like, where are the elk? Oh my gosh. And I'm like, that was the guy that bugled. I was like, I bet he got up on the top of this hill, saw us down here and decided, oh, I'm going to go around. But to me, like I would have went down there and been like, hey, like you guys got a bull you're after. Like I would have went down there and talked to these guys if I was Let's him. Let's not screw everything up for everybody. We know there's a bunch of bulls in there. Let's go in there and we can both be successful here. Like I don't care. Any of those bulls that I saw were would have been awesome right. and I would have been really happy with. I was like, I'm not getting locked in on one butt on one bull and like I'm not gonna shoot any other bull. Like all of them are mature, all of them are herd bulls, and they're all kind of in the same area. We can both go in there and get it done. Instead, he just, I don't, I don't know if he saw me or not, but like kind of the way he, he looked back at me and smirked and I don't know. I, I used to do this when I played, I would make up a a fake scenario in my head, like a false narrative about like the guy I was playing against that he was like talking shit about me or (laughs) that he had like his, he had like a opinion about me or he was like, he didn't like me, this and that. Like, so I would like make that up in my head and use it for fuel. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe I made that up in my head that he like did it on purpose, but I don't know. He kind of smirked at me. And so whoever you are, (laughs) 
you're, oh, you're I, about to get it. And it's not a big unit, but they give out 100, 100 tags, I think. There's a lot of elk in there. And there's a ton. Saw. There's a ton of elk, but they were all herded up. Yeah. And like, I mean, they were all herded up. Like the, the one day, the next day after that, we saw him again, but he was just him and he had taken all of those cows. Oh, geez. He stole all those cows. Oof. All of them. He and they came up over this. I I did it just never stopped. It was like a, a river of elk <laughs> of cows just coming over, pouring over. And then the very last elk was the was that bull. And they've got bumped off a water hole, I guess. Um, because somebody on the other side had told us, like, yeah, they we bumped them off of there. And I was like, I was like, well, they I mean, they poured over here, Jeez. you know, and he came. You know how bulls are, they don't even really know what's going on, why they're running. They're right. just like, I'm just following, I'm the, following cows. the cows. He's just like trotting along and he's so big. Like, I mean, it's just huge. Um, and then they go up into this, into this juniper, like uh, under these junipers, like on the side of this mountain. And we ended up beating them up there before they could get there and mm -hmm. cut in there. And then like they, they kind of fed in there and we had a guy spotting for us and he could never find the bull. It's just the cows. So we were just in there in these cows just and we could around with just, the cows. Yeah. Just like sneaking around. And I'm like, dude, what are we doing that's here? Gonna, like, that's going to create an eruption of in the junipers of elk just running everywhere. Exactly. So we just stayed there all day, sat down and stayed there and waited till he could give us like an idea where the bull was. I mean, we sat there for four or five hours and nothing. Couldn't find him. He's like, Jeez. he's not here. I don't know where he went. He's just not there. You know, they will after sometimes they will go on their on by themselves and go wallow or go, you know, get water or whatever. And leave their cows for a while, and they kind of do a lap and see if there's other cows that yeah. are in heat. Um, I've seen that a couple of times. Uh, usually, not not often. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever seen it where he had that many cows and did that. But I mean, it you was, never know what kind of situation he was in. You know, water. Or, at minimum, there was a hundred cows. At minimum, good lord. I just it was like a it was like a herd of cattle coming over there. You know what I mean? Like just yeah. a giant herd of them. Yeah. Um, and then you know we just we, that was the last day the last like evening. And then the next morning we go and hit like some, some timber stuff. I was like, let's just go try to hit something that we know that there's not anybody there. Cause everybody know everybody in the area knows that this giant bulls there, you know? Cause I guess that, you know, in New Mexico, they, for archery season, they do the two different hunts. Yes. So I guess in first archery, there was like seven trucks hunting. In. So oh, geez. that tells you that's, you know, you got a minimum of two guys in each truck. Right. So you got, you know, 14, 15, 16, probably 20, probably 20 people hunting this, same this elk, the same bull. Yeah. Um, so like this, and then they tell their buddies, Oh, there's a bull. And you know, so they were all hunting the same. Everybody was in there. Like there was, and there was a lot of County roads that people were taking side by sides on and hunting them off the side by side. Right. And I think that's why they weren't responding very well, because I think that there was a lot of hunters and they were all bugling and everybody that has a tube is ripping bugles at them. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, I know that's not a real bull. Yeah. You know, that doesn't sound like Frank at all. Yeah. That does not sound like, yeah. you know, Frank over there. He wants to fight, you know? Yeah. And I was like, all right, you know, let's go in this other area for the next, last morning. I'm leaving that evening um, or that afternoon I was leaving. So I was like, let's just try to, you know, throw a little Hail Mary and see what happens over here. We go back there and we get out of the truck and I'm like, oh, there's a bull back here. He's like right there. I'm like, sweet. This is going to work out. It's like last day. I was yeah. like, this is how it goes with yeah. these elk, you know, like you just got to keep after him. And so I'm, so we, I rip, we rip a bugle. He answers back. I'm like, Oh, he wants to play. And then I hear a cow. I hear that he's got a cow down there. So I'm like, Oh, this is perfect. Our wind is right. Um, and then he shuts up. So like, I couldn't really locate him. I didn't want to bomb down over that hill and him not knowing exactly where he is. So we, we kind of stood there for a little bit waiting and, then uh, we let out a cow call and then some turkeys gobbled like two big gobblers right there. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Yeah, no kidding. And then I was like, all right, let's just try to rip one more bugle. So we rip another bugle. Nothing. I'm like, damn. I was like, maybe he left. And then I hear a moo cow. And he goes, Rrr! he rips a bugle. He's still in the same spot. And I'm like, oh, he's right there. So we, we get down there, we get on him. Um, and we're like, Pro, it's pretty thick. I don't know, probably a hundred yards from him. And we look over and the cow is up on the hill staring right at us at like, you know, 90 yards yep. staring right. I mean, just staring right at us, sees us. Like we stick out like sore thumbs on this hill mm -hmm. um, with the sun blazing in our face. You know, we're just like, 
staring right at us. And this bull, this bull comes up and follows her up there and she goes and takes off running. And he follows her. And that was that. Jeez. We tried to, we got over to the next ridge and got, and it, it was, they knew they, the jig was up, you know, like they knew that we were there. It, it didn't matter. Like they were yeah. just, he was going to keep pushing her as far as he, it, we would never, we could follow him all day. It wouldn't have mattered. You know, he, he knew we were there. If, if it was easy, we wouldn't do it. Right. Exactly. So, um, <clears throat> so before we get into retirement and, and why you hunt or, or, you know, why you decided to come back into that, let's talk a little bit about your career. Cause you obviously played football since you were a kid Yeah. and, and being a, a, a Super Bowl champion, there's a huge span of very intense time in your life. Um, so you played as a kid, always big, kind of required. What, what do you think set you out, separated you from, you know, there's big kids everywhere. You said, you know, there was a big kid in your same class. Yeah. What separated you from that? So I think it's a, there's, there's a lot of things to go. There's a lot of big guys that aren't professional athletes, you know? Right. And I think it came down to like, I was just naturally athletic. Um, I never like. I never like looked in the mirror and was like, man, I'm too big to do that. Or I'm too big to move that way. Or I always looked at like the smaller guys and was like, I could do that. You know, I can run that way. I can jump that way. I can, I could do all of that, you know, and I could, and then I would look at the big guys and, you know, be like, I could lift like that. Mm -hmm. So I just never, I never like put myself in a box. It's like, Oh, I'm just a big guy that is just going to be in the way. Um, that was the first, that's, that was the first thing. Cause when I was young, I started playing when I was seven years old, full contact football. My gosh. Um, so they put the, they put Most me kids in, don't even know their name hardly by then. No, but I knew I, and you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, what kind of childhood I had. I, you know, I came from a, a lot of violence in my house, um, a lot of trauma behind that and a lot of rage that was inside of me from going through like what was going on at home. So to me, like if I going out on the field and unleashing that, it was awesome. Like it was just so fun. Like from day one, off. The first time I stepped on the field, they, I didn't play offense the first that first season. I just played defense. Um, they put me in middle linebacker, and I had a bar down the middle of my face mask, and they put me in a middle linebacker. And they said, "I don't, I don't remember ever having a play call." They just said, "You see the ball, you get the ball." I'm like, "All right, hit everybody that has the ball." And I'm like, "All right." So I just was out there, just crushing, running into people, like just running with zero sense of like self um what is it called self preservation self preservation was gone like i didn't care about you know and it, when you're a kid you don't care about it anyways yeah so then you add like being, some kids don't some kids are overly self preserved right well that's because their parents call them. <coughs> their parents do it with them when they're young and they're babies right. and stuff and they're like oh you have to let kids like yeah there's yeah i'm not going to let my daughter jump off the you know the top ropes of the of the house you know like but like i will let her jump off the couch and off the bed and like let her see what it feels like to like, you know, to hit something kind of hard, you know, bump, get bumped and bruised and don't bait like in that's And that's, sh and that shows in her toughness now that she like, it's all about your reaction to it. Right. Yeah. And my reaction, the reaction I was getting from my coaches, which was like, yeah, like, it, yeah, it hurts. It's, it's not like, Oh, that doesn't hurt. Yeah. It hurts every time you hit somebody, but the reaction I was getting was like a positive reaction. So I was being positively reinforced to be violent. You know? yeah. So it was like, uh, this controlled violence is like perfect for me, you know? Um, then the next year they decided to put the ball in my hand and I didn't like, I hated offense because I loved tackling people and I didn't like really getting tackled. Um, so my coach was like, the quicker you score, the quicker you get back on defense. So I was like, Oh, there's some motivation. Okay. That makes sense to me. So give me the ball give me the ball. And I would just like, I just make it happen. I just get there, you know, just get to the end zone. And I, then I learned that like, as long as if you don't cower from being hit, if you don't cower from it, treat it like you're def you're on defense, hit him, make him feel it. So like whenever people try to tackle me, I would make them feel it, you know, Drop the and just run through, it. try to run through them, stiff arming people. Like I just, it made sense to me to do that. And I watched a lot of NFL football. So I was watching, you know, Reggie white and Brett Favre and, um, that watching them win, win a Super Bowl and watching the way that like people ran the football and tackled people like that's where I was watching my how to play. And um, like I carried the ball. I went to seven different elementary schools. So I played for um, one, two, three, 
for four different schools. I played for four different teams until I got to um, high school. So I played for all these different teams and every team that I would, you gotta understand the best athlete on the team is usually your running back and your middle linebacker or your quarterback or whatever, you know, but those that like, and they're usually clicked up in these smaller towns, right? Like you get to one little small town, this next small town, like they're all clicked up, you know, they're, they've been going to school since together since they were little and playing football since they were seven. So every, yeah. And so every time I'd go to a new school, I'd have to take that job from somebody. And the parents didn't like it. And I had to carry a birth certificate around and, you know, figure out my own way to get to practice and figure out my way to get through the games and figure out how to get cleats. And I just like, wow, that's, that's why I, I loved it. I didn't care what I had to do, whatever I had to do to get those things. And at that age, I just, I knew I was like, I want, I don't ever want to do anything other than play football. That's what I do. What do you do? I play football, right? That's just what I did. And that's what I love to do. And I loved it. I also loved being like in the outdoors. Like that was, those were two things that I knew I loved to do. And I knew one of them was going to be a way out. Right. I knew one of those things could get me out of here and can can get me an education, get me paid, you know, make it so that I don't have to, you know, I could change the trajectory of like my, my generational bullshit that was going on, you know, family tree, that family tree, I could completely change it and break that cycle. And I can do, and this is the vessel I can use. So I, I just like, I knew, I understood that at a young age. Um, and I was, I was a bonehead in high school, but I still like everything I did was like, I made sure I could, I could play. Like I made sure I was eligible. I made sure like I went to school because I could, if I didn't, I couldn't play football, you know? So finally I get to get to this high school and, um, I'm living, I'm living on that black Angus farm with that family and, um, awesome family. Um, really, really did a good job of teaching me like hard, what hard work really looked like, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing is like people get complacent and think like I work hard. Right. But you can always work harder. Always. I don't care how hard you freaking work. You can always work hard. There's always more, you know, you can always run to the ball a little harder. You can always play through that, play through the snap just a little bit harder. You can always train a little harder. You could do one more workout, you know? Um, stuff like that. They taught me, they taught me that, you know, and then I got to college. So I get, I started getting a lot of looks as a sophomore in high school and then junior year, um, really played good football and went to some, um, some camps. I got invited to the uh, Nike camp because my head coach like kind of entered me into the, into the deal. And he, you know, I, I got a ride to it and there's a bunch of, I was a sophomore, it was going into my junior year and I had a bunch of kids there were already committed to division one schools. And I was just dogging them. Like they could not block me. I, I was out running them, out lifting them, like everything. And um, all these coaches were like, well, who's the hell? And you were a sophomore? Yeah. And they're like, who the hell are seniors? And I'm like six, as a sophomore, I'm six four, two hundred sixty 260 pounds, 265 pounds, something wow. like that. So, um, well, like probably like 250, I was like 255, I think. Um, so I was just, you know, I was running. I could run. I just understood how to run fast and how to burst and how to change direction had a jump and I had an instinct for the ball. Right. So, and I had an instinct for like using my hands and leverage and stuff like that just like made sense to me. So, uh, junior year comes and played really good, played really, really good football. And then the offer started pouring in my junior year, going through my junior year, they just started pouring in. Um, and I decided to commit to Cincinnati because, um, there's a bunch of, there was a bunch of, uh, I didn't carry the ball in high school. I was an offensive lineman because we ran a wing T oh. and I was too tall to be carrying the football. You know, just, it just made no sense to be carrying the ball that tall at, you know, six, four, six, five. Yeah. It's stupid. Um, and then we didn't throw and I would have been a good tight end, but we didn't throw the football. We just ran the ball. So he's like, line up and maul whoever's in front of you. I'm like, all right, cool. So that's what I did. And a lot of the big 10 schools wanted me to play offensive line um, because I'm a white boy and, you get a stigma as a white boy. They kind of like, they kind of poop on your athleticism. You know, they're like, uh, yeah, we don't care. You're just a hard hat guy, hardworking, you know, effort guy. Um, that's, you get that stigma as a, as a white guy on the defensive line. It's just the way it goes. It's whatever. Um, I enjoyed it. It was like a chip on my shoulder, you know? And once again, back to using it. Exactly. Just use it. And then Cincinnati was like, um, you know, Brian Kelly was the head coach there. They were winning football games. Um, they were, you know, they were in the big East, which was, you know, 
which was a BCS, you know, type of div- type of um, conference. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna get to play against West Virginia and Pitt, Syracuse and Louisville, and those are the schools I'm gonna be playing against. So I'm gonna get good looks from NFL scouts and. Mm-hmm. like that's going to work. And he, I knew I'd get to play right away. Like I wasn't going to have to deal with the red shirt. And cause if you give me a red shirt year, I'm going to, I'm going to screw it up. Like I, I'm going to, I like to have fun too much. You know, uh, I was a wild boy and I had a lot of fun and I trained, I worked hard and played harder, you know, like that was kind of the way I did it. And it was working out for me. So I, why would I stop? You know? And I knew if I red shirted, it was going to be a bad idea. That's amazing. At that age, you knew that. I knew it. Then yeah. You're like, I'll screw that up. Yeah, I knew it. I knew I would. <coughs> I was like, you're telling me that I have a whole year just to like, all I have to do is work out and go to class and practice, practice. and then, and then party. Like, Oh my God. It, it's going to get bad. Yeah. So, so I went to Cincinnati and started playing. Well, for the, so Travis and Jason Kelsey were like the first people I met when I, when I committed there before I committed there and Travis and I became like, good friends right away, you know? And I was like, all right. Um, <laughs> I was like, all right, this is where I'm going, you know? Cause he was like, I'm committing here. And I was like, well, I'm coming here too. Um, so we ended up living together in the same house. Uh, freshman year, come, freshman year, we were in the dorms, obviously freshman, sophomore year in the dorms, junior, senior year, we lived in a house together, but we lived in the same dorms, like right across from each other and stuff. And, you know, we just like, we would, we would go out and have fun, but like when it was time to part to train, like we got after it and I got to play, um, you know, my first time flying on an airplane was my freshman year of college. Never been on an airplane before. You're kidding me. Yeah. Never flown anywhere. Uh, flew to Norman, Oklahoma, played against the Sooners first game. Uh, well, second game of this, of the year, first game, um, <laughs> first game we played against like a one double a school. And I just went out there and dominated these guys. Like they couldn't, where did this guy come? Yeah. From? I was just kicking their, kicking their ass. Like it was, I was like, this is, this is easy. You know, I was like, I got this next game, <laughs> Sam Bradford, that sooner team, now the Oh yeah. nine national championship team. Oh yeah. We go into Norman and the most people I'd ever played in front of was like probably, uh, I think that first home game we had like 25, 30,000. That was the most I ever played in front of Let's go to Oklahoma. It's like 90,000 yeah. boomer sooner. I'm like, Holy First of all, I'm still like traumatized by the plane ride because like the first time you're <laughs> on a plane, I was like, how, I was like, what, how is this thing flying? <laughs> like, how yeah. is this happening? I don't you understand know? the dynamics with this. Yeah. And I was just like, I was like, this is wild. Um, I go out there first snap, jump off sides. First snap of the game. I jump off sides. I'm like, but this is where like having a short memory comes in. Second play. Boom. I like beat the I don't know how it happened. I just got lucky and beat the center. Just like beat him off the. I just I'm like I'm just getting the ball as hard as I can. Whatever. As soon as the ball snaps, I'm going. Gone. And I fly off the ball and run right into the running back and TFL. Oh, <laughs> I'm me. like I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was like I don't know how that happened, but it did. And then you know we ended up getting our butts whooped, but still it was like you know I could do this, you know, because I was out there like holding my that whole offensive damn near the whole offensive line went to uh, went to the NFL. And I was yeah. like I could do this. Um, and then my sophomore year comes and I started every single game and had like six, seven sacks. And we went to the sugar bowl, played against Tebow oh, wow. his senior year, got Molly Wap there, but, um, I was still, I was playing really good football and I was like, I can, I can do this. And then like older guys that were going to the league would be like, dude, you got this. Like you, you keep, keep it up. You're going to be fine. I was like, all right. And then junior year, Brian Kelly leaves that sophomore year. We get another guy named Butch Jones. He comes in and he's like, you're lazy, you're soft, you're this and that. And I'm like, what the hell? Like, I thought, you know, I thought I was like hot shit. But then I, but that's where like, I put my ego aside and was like, you know what? He's just trying to get the best out of me. So I just like went full bore. And that junior year was tough because we didn't win a lot of games. And uh, it was just like totally flip flopped. And it, it was hard, man. Like we would. Our workouts, our workout routines and stuff, like we would run one tens until we threw up and squat until you couldn't walk. And then, you know, it was just tough. And then you're not winning. And it's like, you just came off of being a, we were the number three team in the country coming into that season, you know? And it's like, we, what is going on here? You know? And then 
finally I, we had just all kind of bought into it, you know, like, okay, fine. Uh, senior year comes around. Uh, I was going to leave as a junior because I had a chance, like I was probably going to be like a third or fourth round draft pick and I was going to leave. And you know, when you're dead broke with no bank account, that's you know, pretty, pretty attractive. Third or fourth round. You're talking at that time, you're talking like, you know, probably seven, $800,000 signing bonus, yeah. maybe. So you're going to see like four or 500 grand, you know, after like, taxes, we talked about after that. taxes, it's getting cut in half. Yeah. So I'm like, man, that seems like to me, that might as well have been 400 million, you know, didn't matter. So my head coach, Butch Jones at the time, he decided he talks, he, he brings me to his office. He's like, I heard you think about leaving. I was like, it's like, coach, man, I'm just like, I'm like so tired of being broke and not being able to buy anything, not being able to afford shoes and clothes and, you know, meals like everything is a pain in the ass like it sucks yeah. and he was like he's like listen i'm telling you you are leaving so much money on the table he's like give it one more year and i was like all right fine I'll do wow it. so i just was like i locked i you want to talk about locking in i locked the fuck in like i didn't party really i like i would have fun but like not like i was um i would like instead of like at night when i would when guys would go out and you know have fun me, Travis, um, me and Travis and our quarterback and a couple other guys, we would break into the weight room and go in there and work out, do extra workouts. Oh my gosh. And just like, then we'd like go in and play basketball, you know, just to get more cardio. Like we would do all this stuff, extra stuff. Like you, you could come into our house. Yeah. We like, we had a good time. All right. Like we partied and had a good time when it was, there's a time and a place for it, but um, I ended up being the, we go to my, go through my senior year. I ended up being the strongest kid in college football, like numbers wise. Like my numbers were crazy. I mean, I just was like, I was always really strong, but like I took it to another level. Like I was, I was bench pressing like um, 475 for, for sets of three and six oh and stuff gosh. like that. And then I was squatting like almost 700, like 685 for sets of threes and sixes and um, doing multiple sets with that kind of weight, you know? Jeez. hang hang cleaning you know 420 pounds um deadlifting just a ton of weight and like and then our competition the way we did our competitions was wild like we would compete like so hard like we do mat drills which is like basically wrestling where a guy tries to get out from under you and you have to keep him down i would just shoot and climb out of that and then hold people down because i wrestled in high school for a couple of years so i knew what i was <coughs> doing but th those kind of things like and then like the way we practice like we go to training camp and like we, they take us out in the middle of nowhere in Indiana and you're, you stay there for two weeks and it's miserable. Like it sucks. And there's NFL scouts in there and everything. And <laughs> Butch Jones would make us do the defense. We'd be out there doing our, doing our, our team drill. So it's like, you know, ones versus ones. And what he would do to our defense is he'd put the ones out, the one offense out there, they'd run a play. It didn't matter where the ball was. Everybody had to run to that ball. Like if it was a 70 yard bomb, we had to run all the way to the ball, do a hit it and then run back to the line of scrimmage. Oh my God. And we would do that like 10, 12 plays in a row. And it put, I was in such good shape that like, I wouldn't start getting really like feeling tired until like rep, rep eight. Wow. And, but the problem is, is like, you know, I'll never forget this. There's all these NFL. I mean, every, all these teams are there. Cause we got it. I, that, that season we had me, Travis, Isaiah Pede, who was a, a second round pick. Um, John Hughes was a third round pick. Um, we had a fourth round pick, a, a tight end from another um, that was a little older than Travis. Um, we had guys that were going to, that were getting, you know, first couple rounds that were like, so the teams were there. Yeah. But my, one of our other roommates was our left tackle. And I was like, we were running that drill and I started to get kind of tired and I had beat him and he kind of drug me down by my Jersey. And the next time I, the next very next play, I get back to the line of scrimmage and I am pissed, you know? So I come off the ball and I bull rush him and I beat him and he drags me down by my helmet. So I jumped up and punched him in his helmet, like <laughs> right in the face. And my Butch Jones comes running out with a bullhorn. He's like, you just lost us the game. Are you fucking stupid? You know, he's like, <laughs> hold, he's a little guy too. And he just yeah. is like holding my face mask, screaming at me, with this bullhorn. And he's like, and this is in front of all the scouts, right? And yeah. I'm like, fuck. I was like, damn it, why did I do that? And he's like, go over there. He's like, go over to that, go over there and run gassers until I tell you to stop. 
And if you know what gassers are, but it's you run from one side of the field, one sideline to the other sideline, down and back is, is a half gasser, down, back, down, back is a full gasser. And I was running, he said, full gassers. He told his strength coach, coach, full gassers until, until practice is over. And I'm like, and this is like the first like half of practice. So and like you're wore out now. I'm already wore out and we're in full pads. And it's just like, he's like, keep your helmet on. Don't take any of your pads off. And I was like, all right. And I didn't say a word. I ran over there. I went over there and I ran those gassers. It didn't like, didn't make a, I didn't like make a body. My body language was good the whole time. I didn't act like I didn't pout about it. Yeah. I just did it. Practice ended. I ran up, we broke the huddle and I went into a, I went, went in the locker room and lock full body cramp. Just completely oh my gosh. depleted of everything, right? And I like kind of pass out a little bit, and I wake up in a cold tub with none of my clothes on anymore, just my girdle on, and I got IVs in my both both my arms. And it's funny because I thought that that actually hurt. I thought that whole thing hurt my like hurt my the way I looked to, to these coaches. They probably thought I was like a loose cannon, you know. But when I was going through the draft process, um. Cause I went, I had a, I was the big East defensive player of the year. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was all American. I, and I, I just kicked, I, I played so good that season and had so much fun. We won the big East again and we won the big East three out of the four years I was there, you know, so it was a good time. You know, I went to a bowl game, played against Vandy and beat them. And um, then I was going through the draft process. And when I was at the combine, I'll never forget, I forget um, which coach it was, but I never, I'll never forget the question. He was like, He's like, how do you deal with like punishment? You know? And I was like, what do you mean punishment? And he was like, well, forget the question. He's like, what? A, I think it was Sean Payton. I feel like it was Sean Payton. Cause he asked me a couple of good questions, but he was like, you know, we had, we were watching you practice one day and you got kicked out of practice and you had to run gassers. And I was like, oh yeah. And I was like, here we go. I was like, I knew it. You know, in yeah, my head, I was like, I knew it. it. I knew it. He's like, he's like, you know what impressed me? He's like, you ran, you ran as hard as you could every gasser. And never said a word about it. You came in, broke the, you guys broke the huddle down you ran to the locker room. And he was like, that is like the sign of a leader. You know what I mean? Cause you could have easily, you know, you were done. You, he's like, I don't know what the situation was, why you got sent over there to run gassers. Cause they're over there goofing around. They're not, they don't care about any of that stuff, you know? Yeah. But he's like, the fact that you did it and you didn't cry about it and whine about it, that like, I have nothing but respect for you. And I was like, Oh shit. Okay. So it's not a, that's like proof to you, right? It's not about like what happens to you or what your response initially is. It's how you react afterwards, right? Like, you know, I, w I took accountability for it. I didn't like make excuses for it. Like, you know what? I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I cost my team. I could have lost a game, you know, doing that. And, you know, so that's, that's really good. So I practiced like I played, you know, and it was that I never, I didn't get any more personal fouls until I got, I, even when I was in the league, I still like, I continued that. Like I didn't want to ever do anything to hurt the team. You know, it was um, very impactful. It's really good advice. It's not what you do. It's how you react to it. Or it's not what happened to you. It's how you react. Exactly. To it. You, it's, that's what you have control over. Yeah. You don't have control over. Like I, I didn't have control over like my home life as a kid. Right. What I did have control over was how I let it affect me. Right. Right. Yeah. It, it made, it sucked. Like I did, I would go to, I would look at other kids and see that they had both parents around and I didn't have any parents around. And I was like, man, this sucks, you know, but am I going to wallow in that and feel sorry for myself? Or am I going to like do something about it? Right. Um, do something, change your tree, change the, change the trajectory of my, of my path, change your stars, you know, like, yeah. and I did, I did that. I was, I, I just, I know he's, I always thought like, okay, if, if I make a mistake, I can't like wallow in it. I got to just like bounce back from it. And I, you know, I, I take that into, I, I take that same um, mindset into like my, my life after football, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm out here like kind of just kind of wandering, doing different things that I like to do. And it's like, I don't really, I make mistakes all the time, but I, I try to just learn from it and I don't have any fear of making a mistake. I'm not afraid to screw up. You know, it's like, a lot of people go through life and they are so afraid of rejection or failure or all of that. The anxiety behind that, like there is something freeing to saying, fuck it. Yeah. Like not fuck it. Like I'm not going to try. It's like, no, I can whatever guess. happens, happens. All I can control is my effort and my mindset and how I react to the failure that have, if it comes, cause it's going to come. Like if you don't fail, in life, then your life was way too easy and you probably never accomplished anything. So 
you you had a, a change in coaches. You were a junior, mm -hmm. and he called you lazy and all that stuff. Do you think he just saw more in you? Yeah, he saw more in you that you weren't that you weren't acting or reacting like you could be. Was that is that he he knew that I he knew that I could he saw my potential, right? And he was like, "You're only tapping into it." He's like you. He's, he's like getting by on your. He's on like your... every snap should be played like it's gonna be your last, you know. And I'm like, fuck, like that, yeah. that didn't make any sense to me for a long time until like I started doing it. Like once yeah. I did it, and I was like, I get it now. And think good things just happen. Like you can cover up a lot of like, you know, things where you're lacking. Like some, you know, being tall and and big and you know sometimes you're lat you you don't have that like quick little quick twitch that you need to like you know get around somebody right but if i use effort to like really you know go make a play good things are going to happen and it did like right. just playing hard just playing hard you know it's like yeah you're playing hard in between you know you play hard for 1 2 seconds a football play is 6 seconds long so you got to go max effort as hard as you can for 6 seconds and then recover in 25 seconds yeah. and then do that over and over and over and over again. And then like having a short memory, not thinking about the last snap, even if it was good, don't think about that. Like go to the next snap and just moving on to the next one. That's how I, that's, that's why like coaching is so important. Having a good coach that like pushes you, you know, a, a great coach once told me that if I don't say anything, I had a great defense line coach my junior and senior year too. So like he, he helped me take my game to another level too. And I'll never forget one day he was talking about practice and, you know, I was like, he was like, you know, you got to love practice. And I was like, I said this and I don't know why I said it, it was just, you know, sometimes you have a dumbass attack and you yep. just open your mouth when you shouldn't. And I was like, and I was like the leader of the group, you know, and I was like, coach, nobody loves to practice. And he, he got so pissed. His name was Steve Stripling love him like i have so much love for this guy <clears throat> he's got a big mustache and he played in, for the cu buffs you know back yep. in the day and uh, coached a lot of guys and made it to the league a lot of guys and he was like the great ones do they freaked out on me you know <laughs> i was like oh shit all right it's a movie moment but i'll never forget do. that you know what i mean like the way he was like the great ones do like do you want to be good or do you want to be great like there's you know that's like a cliche thing that people say but it's so true and what separates good from great is like, it's a fine line, man. It is not very, it's not like, Oh, I, I wasn't, I hear all the time. People will be like, Oh, must be nice to be, you know, six foot six, you know, 290 pounds. And this. I'm like, I could be six foot six and 350 pounds and sloppy and not care. But I never wanted, I did, I wanted more than just to be a big body, you know, guy that was in the way, you know, and just get a scholarship and, you know, screw around and you know it could have easily done that but that's the easy way out it's called complacency and i just never wanted to feel I, I felt like it was a disease i never wanted to feel that you know so i just i just pushed and pushed and pushed and had good coaches like that and then i get to the nfl i get drafted in the second round i was the first pick to the denver broncos but they it was their second round pick because they didn't have a first round they traded out so i was their first pick and when i showed up in there I was uh, third on the third. Well, yeah, I was third on the on the uh, depth chart, and through through OTAs, which is like um, like your spring stuff, um, all that stuff. I was I, I was I was doing good, but I was like, man, this kind of like it's I, like the competition level is just like so high that like some days I'd be like, man, I don't know if I'm good enough. Yeah, but you could either that's where you have a choice, right? That feeling is valid, right? You it's a valid feeling because now I'm playing I'm not just playing against like the best guy at Cincinnati or the best guy at you know Pitt or West Virginia or you know whatever school. It doesn't matter. I'm playing against literally the best in the country. Yeah, the best of of all those teams there's 30, and everything else. There's 32 teams and you get you get 53 on each roster. So I'm playing against the 0.01% of these, of athletes. So like, they're going to get you sometimes. So I was like, I'm a, I made a hard, I made like a, a hard line in the sand. I was like, I'm just going to make sure that I get them more than they get me. And that was like, that was like, so I stuck with me. Cause it was like, as long as I can, as long as I win more than I lose, 
I'm in the positive. I'm good. You know, so I just would like, you know, if I, if I would lose a rep, you know, I would like really focus on how I lost. How did I lose? Like, not why did I lose? How did I lose? How did I screw that up? Like, because at the end of the day, the only person that can stop you is you, right? I made a mistake that he capitalized on because I'm good too. Like, don't forget that you're good too, right? They picked you. They picked me for a reason, right? So finally through training camp, I just like, I figured it out. Like play, it's all, it's a, it's all technique. Like technique and effort is like the key to success. It's just like why you film your hunts. You want to say, Mm -hmm. you want to see what, what can I, what can I improve the next time I'm in that situation? Yep. Never be. And I, and that's the other thing with coaches. Coaches never want to tell you something twice. Like when a coach would tell me something, I, it stuck with me. Um, I never had a, I never had difficulty learning plays and what my responsibility was. I knew what my job was and I was going to do my job, right? Do your job as at the best of your ability. That's all they're looking for. Right. Like they're not asking you to go out there and do something, you know, be Captain America, do something incredible, do your job. Right. So my job was to stop the run and help Vaughn get sacks. And I'm like, all right, we can do that. I could do that. Let's go, you know, and, and put and affect the quarterback. Like that, so, that was to me, that made sense. So, so I'll tell you what happened is I go to, we go in my fr- my rookie training camp and I just slowly was playing better than the other two guys. And these guys were vets. Like, um, and you don't realize it till you're an older guy in the league, but once when you're young, you don't know it, but when you're older and you have a family, these younger guys are coming to take food off your plate. And that's what I was doing. I was coming there to take their job and I did it. There's a way to do it, go about that though, you know, respectfully. And, and I did it respectfully. And those guys like really respected me for the way that I did it. And like, I earned that starting job. So opening in the first preseason game, we played against the bears. I got there and have two sacks and a TFL right away. Wow. And he was, they were like, they pulled me and told me I'd have to play the rest of the game. I was like, and uh, I remember Willis, remember Willis McGahee? Oh, yeah. Willis McGahee came up to me and said, hey, Brooke, you know, nobody ever gets pulled out as a rookie. And I was like, oh, that's that's wild. He was like, he's like, you, you're doing everything right. And it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. He's like, they don't want you to get hurt, you know, because these games don't mean anything. So first game, we play against the Steelers. And the Steelers were supposed to draft me in the first round. They called me, told me they were going to draft me in the first round. Da, da, da. They drafted an offensive lineman, so. I grew up 50, you know, 50 minutes from PA, from Pittsburgh. Yeah. So like the, I fly into the Pittsburgh airport when I go home. Like that's how we, you know, that's, that's my hometown team. And I knew, I just was like, I got to ball out on these dudes. Like, I got to go crazy. And I did. I just went out there and went nuts. Had a, had my first sack against Big Ben in that game. Had a, T, a big TFL, batted ball, uh, like a fumble recovery. Wow. Like just went crazy, you know, and then it just kept rolling. And then we went to the playoffs and lost in the first round of the playoffs. And I was like, Dang. you know, and the culture that I was brought into right away, you got to understand Peyton Manning was our quarterback. Yeah. Like I get drafted by the Broncos. John Elway's the f- guy that calls me. And then Peyton Manning texts me and I'm like, Holy You're shit. You're like, what in the heck just happened? Yeah. And Peyton was like, I'm, he would come and have breakfast with me. Cause like he, he understood like how to, he was like the best teammate ever. He understood that like the key to his success was also went through me as well. Yeah. You know? Like I, he needs me just as much as I need him. And he never made you, he always made you feel that way. That like he needed you just like back in college when they, or in, in was it high school or, or uh, middle school or whatever we, we said, you want to get back on defense, get on offense. Peyton Manning knew in order for me to get back on offense, I needed my defense to do what they got to go three and out. Do. We got to make them go three and out. And then yeah. he understood that like, even if we're not going to score, you know, a ton of points here. We're going to try to hold the ball as long as we can to give our defense a break. And that's just the way he thought, you know, and he, um, he would come and encourage me at breakfast. And like, again, I was a wild boy. Like I had fun. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that there's a couple of times where it was things that were like, yeah, you probably should do that, you know? <laughs> um, and he would be like, Hey man, like put his arm around you and go, he'd be like, yeah, you don't need to. He's like, he's like, maybe don't do that. And I'm like, you know, but he did it in a way that was like, not like a disappointed dad or like a, yeah. you know, a, Oh, you shouldn't do this. It was like a, a big brother a sibling type of thing where he was like, Hey man, like I know it's fun, but like, yeah. You know, do you want to be, he would say things like you want to be great, you know? And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. He's like, well, you know, just lock it in. So, yeah. you know, 
second, my second, and then I played really good football that year. Like I was, I mean, I was uh, AFC West rookie of the year, you know, so I was playing good football and I, so I took my training to like a whole nother level. Like that I went to, I was in South Florida training, still being wild, but down there in Miami and stuff. But, yeah. But I was still, you know, <laughs> super, super strict with my regiment. Um, second year comes around and in, in the first preseason game that I play in, um, I bruised my spinal cord and I'm paralyzed. You're and, kidding. No, was, I was, I was just going to ask you about how did you keep from being, <sighs> man, it was like, it was the first time I'd ever been like really injured, you know? And it was the, 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 the part that sucked about it was that like, I didn't understand what was really wrong with me and we didn't understand what was wrong. Um, but I was so paralyzed. You blew your knee up and went, well, yeah. that's what well, happened. Well, I, I broke my leg or yeah. I broke this or like tore that. You know, there was no like scientific answer for what was going on. It was just like, um, well, the, you know, your light switch turned off. And <laughs> I was, I never was knocked out though. Like I was awake. Oh my God. And gosh. I just couldn't feel anything for three hours, you know? And then like it all started coming back. Well, I played again two weeks later. I was back on the field. You're kidding me. Back on the field against the Ravens because they beat us in the playoffs. And I was like, I'm not missing this game. And I was like really struggling with my mental health because I was having like crazy hallucinations at night. I was having terror attacks at night. I was having like suicidal thoughts. I was having like deep, deep depression. So like the only place I was and then like my outlet was football. So like every time I got touched in the face or the head, my arms would go numb and it was like, it, it wasn't just like it would, you know, when you sit on the toilet for too long and yeah, it stings, full, yeah. it was like twice that stinging was just like so intense and numb that, it, but I just like blocked it out and just did it. You know, like there's, there's videos of me making plays and then me getting up and just like, I'd, I'd like celebrate and howl. And then like, I get to the sideline and I'd be sitting there with just like a dead look on my face. Cause like I was in so much pain. Oh my gosh. And then, um, I was having a hard time, like keeping weight on for some reason. Like I just was like dropping weight. I was like, man, what is going on? I was like, I got all the way down to like 275, oh, two seventy five, two, And I was like, what is going on? I'm normally like two at two ninety, three hundred pounds, you know, like it's not a problem for me to be that weight. It's easy. And I was like, what is going on? Couldn't figure it out. And then, um, we go, we go, we're flying to Kansas city to play the chiefs and we get on the bus to go to the airport and we pull up to the airport and I'm sitting there and I feel really weird. Um, like you ever been like, you probably felt it on the mountain where you're like super dehydrated and you feel like you're just going to fall over mm -hmm. and you're like, I just need to sit down and have some water, you know? Yep. yep. Well, that's how I felt. I was like, I feel like I'm dehydrated. Something's going on here. And I'm like a three piece suit, you know? And my buddy, our offense, one of our offense line beside me is trying to talk to me. And I'm just like, eh, you know, like, not there. And he's like, you all right? And I said, yeah, I just need some Gatorade. And he like throws me a Gatorade. I chug this Gatorade. And as soon as I put the cap on, I just, it all goes, black. everything was, went black. It was like, everything was coming to close in, like, and all the light oh, just yeah. went away. And then I wake up with, I wake up with my shirt open and they're like shoving their thumb into my sternum. And I, and it hurts so bad. And I was like what the fuck? And I woke up and then I like <sighs> passed out again. Um, then I wake up 36 hours later in a hospital with Whoa. strapped to an ICU bed with like my, these like little boxing glove things on my hands. It looked like little boxing gloves, like on my hands. And I was strapped to the bed. I had IVs everywhere. My throat hurt really bad. And I had all this stuff wrapped around my head. So what happened was I had a seizure. So I had a seizure and then when I was in the hospital, when they got me to the hospital, they were like, I was like in full flight or flight mode. So I was like ripping IVs out of my arm, throwing nurses on the ground. Oh my gosh. Like freaking out, you know, and they said not, not saying a word. So they thought I was on like drug, some kind of drugs, you know? So mm -hmm. they, um, they were hitting me with, they were tranquilizing me and it was like, I'd like kind of slow down for a second and then I'd like, like explode again. Like I broke, they, they tied me down and I broke one of the beds. Oh my gosh. So I just like went crazy. Um, and then uh, my throat was hurting real bad. <clears throat> you still hear it sometimes. It happens when it gets dry. Mm -hmm. But um, I, the reason why I was strapped to the bed is because when I, they got me to, they got me asleep the one time and got a breathing tube into my throat then later. and I ripped it out. I tried to rip it out. I like woke up and Not tried ideal. to rip it out and they're like, what the hell is going on with this guy? Um, so they had to induce a coma. 
So when I, and I woke up, um, with the breathing tube still in and then like, I fell back asleep and I'm like, what the hell is like, I was, I remember like, I thought I was dreaming. I was like, I thought it was, yeah, yeah, I thought it was just in a dream. And then finally I, I wake up without the breathing tube and I'm like sitting up and I'm like super confused. And, um, one of our trainers is there and he's like, Hey bud, like, <laughs> everybody around me is like, we thought you were going to die because my heart rate was at like 16 beats a minute. Oh my gosh. And they're like, you thought you were going to go to cardiac arrest like this and that. It's telling me all this stuff. Like, like you had a seizure. Um, but you're, you know, we're going to try to figure out what's going on with you. Um, so that whole, we ended up making it to a Super Bowl that year and I didn't get to go and play. Mm-hmm. Like I got to go, but I didn't get to play. Cause I was all, um, I tried to go back to practice after that. And I had like another seizure. So, Oh my God. I don't know what it was that was going on, but like all my adrenals were drained. Like my, uh, everything was drained. I was just running on like, I don't even know what I was running on. I was like at like 20% oh my God. of my capabilities somehow still doing it, you know? Um, and it was just really scary. But then, so I started, so what I did was I, I had to like reconnect my brain and my body. Like I had to like, and when I say that, I mean like I had to, there was a bruise in my spinal cord from that initial hit that never healed. And every time I got hit, it just rebruised it. And there wasn't any fresh, that's right on my SC one where that happened. Oh so right at the base of my brainstem. So, um, the reason why I didn't, I wasn't fully paralyzed, like for good is because I have twice as much fluid as the normal human, even somebody of my size would have really. Yeah. So it's like, I'm built for this shit, you know, <laughs> like I was like born and like, in a, like in a lab to like play football, you know, really? it's like, yeah. So like, I, it they said it, what happened was he's like it must have bent it bent your spinal it like concussed your spinal cord so not like a brain concussion like a concussion like a bruise on your spinal cord um and then you're so you're only getting like minimal fresh blood to your brain and that's what was going on so i had to do a lot of work i did a lot of therapy like um physical therapy um a lot of mental brain training a lot of um, what happened to work the most which was yoga. Mm-hmm. I started doing yoga, doing like um, a ton of yoga, like doing a lot of it. And then I was training, working out again, lifting weights again. And so it just started building back. And like next, I'm able to do handstands and headstands and stuff like that again and strengthen my um, transverse abdominal, which is like your um, small, like the muscles that kind of keep you upright. Yeah. It's the small, it's not like the showy abs it's It's the the internal internal core the the internal core like i started strengthening all that stuff um to like protect my neck you know and give me that confidence again and the next seat that next season we could show up nobody knows how i'm gonna be or how i'm gonna feel but i was back to like 305 pounds and kicking butt really yeah no problems with my neck and nothing nothing like that and i played all 16 games and we go to the playoffs lose the colts and that sucked um then Boom, snap, fast forward to my fourth year. Now I'm in a contract year. Now, and if anybody understands what that's like for, for an NFL player, your con, your fourth year is the most important year as far as like setting yourself up for life. So I knew I had to, I had to kick ass, you know? So I really locked into my training and like really dialed it in, dialed in my diet. I was eating just like nothing but bison and sweet potatoes and broccoli. Like that's really? all I ate. Um, and then um sorry levi just distracted me <laughs> did he shoot it cool sweet we get to see another it. buck down another buck down jeez so so fourth year so you so, so fourth you, year so you gotta yeah. lock this in because the first three years is like a trial period right i mean you're getting paid and stuff but it's you're getting paid rookie minimum you're getting paid your rookie contract you know yeah. which is uh, which is a lot, it's a lot of money, but it's still like, it's not enough to like, it's not changing the tree to change the, yeah, it's, a, it's not generational wealth, like, right. unless you're like a top 10 pick, you know? Right. So I, um, I ended up uh, getting suspended for the first four games because I took a Viagra Oh. and I didn't know that like, because like I said, I like that fun and I was having too much fun and I just didn't even think about it and it's normally out of your system pretty quick but i guess there's like some kind of i don't know there's something in it that like pops Pops some sort of you know they they were all really confused like we were all confused about it and i could have fought it and probably would have won 
But if I lose, that drags on to the end of the season. And now everybody's <coughs> now leading into contract. They're, they're thinking about that. Mm-hmm. And I might miss a Super Bowl or something like that. And I know that it's Peyton, one of Peyton's last season. It's probably his last season. Yeah. So this is the last chance that we're going to have a, like a really good quarterback. So I got to make this happen. And um, so I took the four game hit, you know, and it cost me like 400 grand. And that sucked. But I came back and was rolling. I mean, I was rolling. I was, uh, and the whole time that I was, was training, like in the off seasons, my whole time in the league, I always worked like boxing and striking um, because it was like, that's what pass rushing and playing defense line is. It's like being violent with your hands and mm-hmm. like placement of your hands and everything and moving your feet and creating angles. So I did all, I did a lot of that um, for those four weeks, like nonstop. Like, cause you have, you still have to practice though, right? <clears throat> no, during no, nothing. No. So I had my helmet, my pads and I had a, um, one of my buddies, um, his name is Justin Bannon. He's actually in prison right now. Um, but he was a reti- he played 12 years. He had his pad still. He just retired. And he was like giving me good looks on the offense line, you know, <laughs> like playing like because he was he played offense line and knew what he was doing. And so we would like work pass rush and run stopping and doing all this and doing that. And then like my my trainer, Lauren, who trains me still, um, we would do when the game was we would work out while the game was on. And whenever we would do something high intensity, high intensity movement while the defense was on the field, in, like during a play. Yeah. And then we would rest and then do it again. And do, like, that's how we trained. So when I came back, I was ready to go. Like I was playing. in shape. And that first, that was the first year I had a coach named Bill Kolar, um, who actually played for Montana state. Okay. Um, and he's from Ohio and he was a first round pick played nose guard for like 10 years in the NFL. Um, in the seventies and eighties and wow. he's just a psycho. And he was another guy that like, he was like, you're good, but you're, he's like, you're not giving me like everything. I know it. And he like took me to another level. It was crazy. Um, and then we just, I just, I just, I played so good that year. We just, I was dominating it could, and I had a great coach. He was teaching me new moves and this and that. And we were kicking ass and our defense was unreal, but our offense wasn't great. And then, go to the playoffs and dominate and kick ass and go to the Super Bowl. And that was like the easiest game we played all season was the Super Bowl. <laughs> really? It was, yeah. It was a, like easiest game we played all year, win the Super Bowl. And <laughs> I was just like, Holy shit. Like this is what I dreamed. Like watch it. Remember, I remember being seven years old and watching Reggie white run around the field with the, with the trophy, with the Lombardi trophy. And he had a, he had the Super Bowl t-shirt over his Jersey and pads. And I did that. I was like, I went and got, got, got it, grabbed the thing and just was running around everywhere. Like, and I was like, man, I got to literally, literally got to live out my childhood dream. Like literally got to do it. You know? so Most awesome. people like get close or maybe get to do it, but I literally got to do it. And it was just, it was just so awesome. Um, and then um, I'm actually in a good, we go to Vegas to celebrate the win. And my waitress is this beautiful woman that, wouldn't give me another bottle of tequila. (laughs) And I was like, what the heck, you know? And then we started talking and, uh, you know, fast forward and we're married. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. We're married now. And, um, I just fell in love with her like right away. And she was just awesome. You know, and I was just so sick of the, you know, empty relationships that I was having. And she just like, I knew she, I, something in my, in my bones, like told me she was like the right one, you know, and I made the right choice. Cause she is just an awesome woman and holds it down for me and holds me accountable and pushes me to be great. And then if you've learned anything from this conversation is like, when I have a person in my life that like holds me accountable and pushes me, I do great things, do great things. So <clears throat> that's, that was like really important to me and have that as a life partner means you're going to be doing great things for a very long time. Exactly. And she, she stops me, she stops me before that dumbass attack really kicks in, you know? So yeah. 